My name is David Hallway. I'm a professor at UC San Diego in Ecology, Behavior, Evolution, and the Division of Biological Sciences. And I'll be moderating this session, which is uh, San Diego Canyon Conservation. There are four speakers. Uh, we'll each talk for 15 minutes, and then there'll be time for questions and a panel discussion uh, after that. And our first speaker is uh, Mary Duffy. Thank you. Um, my name is Mary Duffy. I'm with the Earth Discovery Institute, a little nonprofit in East County, San Diego. We also work in South County too. Um, I'm an edge of it in. I'm an environmental educator and outreach director for the Earth Discovery Institute, and I'm also a canyoneer and a an iNaturalist mentor, mentor with the NAP. Um, okay, let's see. Play all these games here. Okay. I'm here to uh, talk about San Diego Canyon conservation and the potential use of urban canyons and watersheds as places for young and old to connect with and learn from nature. Um, we all recognize that we are losing biodiversity at an alarming rate for more reasons than I can account for. San Diego Canyon Lands website lists about 140 named urban canyons. Um, I think these are perfect sites for community engagement, outdoor classrooms, restoration events, guided naturalist hikes, wildlife and watershed studies, et cetera. Nor can you discount the recreational and mental health benefits. Why the need to promote and study the usage of urban canyons because of what connecting with nature does for us and species diversity. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna show you a slideshow here of um, family vacation, but that is my 18 month old granddaughter. Um, um, she, lives, she lives in urban Denver and the only walking access her family has to green space are well manicured urban parks and cemeteries. When she recently visited, the first thing she said every morning was, outside? She repeats that outside, along with shoes, until you open the door. Um, Richard Love, author of Last Child in the Woods, wrote about that lost opportunity to explore as a child, to build forts, tree houses, the value of play, and the value of spending time in nature. Curiosity, exploration, imaginative solo and social play. Because I'm speaking to the choir here, I ask you to reflect on your first fort or your first, first experience that connected you to nature. If you offer youth who don't have access to wild places a guided introduction to nature in a safe place, you open the door. Through EDI's environmental-based field trips, we encourage exploration and discovery outside. After just a few hours in the field, reluctant participants are often heard saying, that was the best field trip ever. I loved it. But field trips are few and far between. In 2014, Anza Elementary School in El Cajon was identified as the most park-poor school in the district, meaning it had no community parks or green spaces within walking distance of the campus. With funding and support from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as part of their schoolyard habitat program, EDI set out to make an abandoned, decomposed granite ball field into a native habitat garden. Over the four-year period, with support from San Diego Foundation, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and SDG&E, and the students and their families, we successfully transformed that lot into a green park, which is, in all of its wildness, still used as part of the learning space at Anza Elementary. You can see in this uh, photo that was the initial work on the park, and then up on top, and then on the bottom, you can see the plants are starting to come in. This is an immigrant population. Um, these people are mostly from the Middle East. This English is a second language, and they jumped on this full bore. I think urban canyons can serve the same purpose. 
A sense of place is a secure investment and, creatures, and creates a sense of stewardship. Urban canyons bring value to neighborhoods. Um, this is actually a Crest Ridge Ecological Reserve in East County. It's the headwaters. We do a lot of watershed work in East County. We don't spend a lot of time in actual canyons because our canyons are very wild in East Can Canyon. But we do spend a lot of time at headwaters of watersheds. This is the headwater of the Sweetwater Watershed and at the, where the watershed runs into the ocean, such as the San Diego Bay National Wildlife Refuge. But I'm gonna use an example here of um, Dictionary Hill. I don't know if many of you have ever heard of Dictionary Hill. It's a little dome of land in Spring Valley. The community led by a neighborhood coalition got the land set aside as open space, adding 175 acres to the county's multiple species conservation plan. The value of a place has to become personal, whether it's key species, beauty, recreation, or a place to find solace and calm. I'm one step ahead of my game here, but I'll uh, continue there. Part of the success with the Dictionary Hill was because a botanist and fellow science educators in the neighborhood engaged the community and formed an alliance. Outreach is vital to who we are, and how we change the public concept that scientists are aloof and unapproachable and that science is, an un, is unforgiving of amateurs. This is a shot here just um, showing how we use technology in the field and being a Luddite will get outdoor educators nowhere. The, uh, the app iNaturalist has become a powerful tool for engaging public. Cell phone photographers are logging tons of observations. They even have an education version for youth called Seek, which you can check out. It's pretty fun. All the collected data is available to anyone, scientists and backyard naturalists alike. The self-education value of these apps is mind-bending. If the natural world can speak to the heart of an 18-month-old child, nature speaks a language that we can all share, and diversity speaks many languages. Nature, in all of its variations, colors, and sounds, brings out the creative spirit in all of us. It awakens fantasy and imagination. These are, um, these are my people. These are my people, lifelong lear learners, volunteers. Um, from babe to grandparent, the sharing of knowledge and experience. Being outdoors at any age triggers the gift of play. Uh, you can see the one volunteer in the middle there goofing his head out. Um, we're actually collecting wild Asclepius fascicularis seed here, narrow leaf milkweed. Where does this take, where does this take us, this science experiment? Um, monarch butterflies. Who knew that such a studied and gentle creature could be surrounded by so much misunderstanding and conflict? If you were up at the other um, session right now, you'd hear a lot about this. Murder, logging, toxic milkweed, parasites, pesticides, climate change, the cartels, the forces against them mounting. EDI is working on protecting and propagating native milkweed, especially Asclepius fascicularis, in efforts to establish the plants on reserves and refuges, and I think this would be a great urban canyon project. The monarch butterfly story is a part of every science educator's quiver. Lastly, not to be a Debbie Downer, but to promote education, outreach, and support research and hope. I recently visited Oregon Pipe National Monument with a cadre of my Canyoneer buddies. The saguaro cactus, the cactus that is so important and revered by the Tohono O'odoman people, so much so that they call them by the same word they use for people, are being mowed down during construction of the wall and left to rot in the sun. That up that upper picture there in the shadow is a 20-foot saguaro cactus. And to be fair, the dead bobcat is um, on the side of Highway 94. I think overpopulation, excessive recreating, uh, development, all of these things can cause situations where people think, oh my gosh, we need to stay out of these canyons. We need to stay out of these different habitats. 
they're very worried that we're eventually going to love nature to death. But from my experience, we don't need to worry about loving nature to death. We need to encourage more people to love nature to death. Share what you know. Invite others to explore nature. Discover awe. The future depends on you, but it belongs to the next generations. That lovely photo there was taken by one of my volunteers out working on the San Diego National Wildlife Refuge. Thank you. So we're going to s save questions until the end. Our next speaker is Eric Bowlby. Good afternoon. Uh, Eric Bowlby, uh, former executive director for San Diego Canyonlands. I've been uh, taking care of the canyons for 20 years since uh, we started the canyons campaign under the Sierra Club banner in 1999. This is a picture of our canyons in the city of San Diego. Each rectangle you see in this picture, is this, this uh, map, is the name of a canyon in our city. And it shows the watersheds too. The Girl Scout cookie green one you see, this big one right here is our San Diego River watershed. You can see all the urban canyons all through here. Um, these are Choyas Creek watersheds down in here and Sweetwater. Um, on up to San Dieguito and Rose Creek watersheds. Um, we, we have an amazing geography. Look at how these canyons are scattered throughout our city. Just like our neighborhoods, just like our schools. What an opportunity to connect people to nature in their neighborhoods and schools and children to nature. Those are our nature classrooms. Look at the geography. This is Mission Valley looking south across uh, I-8 right here. And you can see how they literally are islands of open space that are um, in the midst of a sea of urban development. And it's roads. It's roads that's fragmenting our habitat and cutting off our wildlife corridors. So I wish I had a quarter for every every person that stood up and said, don't build a road through our canyon, because that's why they're here. It's been incredible uh, to learn. It's like canyon lore, to learn how people stood up and said, this is a special place. You're not building a road here. And that's uh, it's true in a lot of canyons, especially Rose Canyon. You probably all know that story. Um, <clears throat> so the core of our mission is sustainable stewardship of our canyons. Obviously, we want to educate why are our canyons important. Restore the canyons. We're, we're, there's, there's, good, there's good state money, Prop 68, Prop 1 money, to come in and restore our canyons. Um, and that's due, due to bond measures that we all voted for here in California. Uh, protect um, dedicating our, our open spaces, having it dedicated by city council, is the strongest layer of protection that we can have. It, it, it requires a two-thirds vote of the citizens of San Diego to reverse that dedication and then use that for something else besides a park or open space. And volunteer, we, we, get, we get volunteers involved around every one of the neighborhood canyons that we possibly can. And that's, this is Normal Heights. We take people on a guided tour of their neighborhood canyon. We talk about why it's important. We, we, we are amidst endangered habitat, which means that there are endangered species that depend upon this habitat. And it's right here in your backyard. And we name the plants. And we tell them which ones are not native and, and how come they're a problem. And then they, they become stewards. The next thing you know, they're in their canyon restoring the habitat. This was a sea of chrysanthemum over here. It's a coastal sage scrub habitat in Switzer Canyon. And this is what it looks like today, with a kiosk at the top for educating a trail coming down uh, so that people can hike and enjoy Switzer Canyon. This is what we're doing, canyon by canyon in the city. Um, the resource values, we never fail to talk about that. The game plan to protect the canyons, that's dedication. Growing educational opportunities, linking our students and, and our youth uh, to the canyons, and as well as adults, to, to learn about our incredible ecosystems and biodiversity. 
Um, and the growing interest in cl collaborations. Collaborations are us. So these are just some shots, Tecolote Canyon, kids walking the dog in, in Tecolote and jogging and, and uh, wildlife, scrub jay. Um, we started a Kids in Canyons program uh, with uh, Aquatic Adventures and now their Ocean Discovery Institute uh, in uh, two, 2005, I believe, in 32nd Street Canyon in, uh, in um, South Park. And uh, any time we can, we can link up with any of these community groups, kids can earn their high school community service credits. So it's a little bit of an, you know, an indentured servitude, but they get to do it right in their own neighborhood canyon, in their own community. Um, paleontological resources are in our canyons. Um, this is Manzanita Canyon. This is an example of where there was a recreation program at Azalea Park Recreation Center, and those students just, just joined us. We decided, okay, today you're going for a hike in your neighborhood canyon, and um, they get really excited. It, it's, to see them connect to nature and start learning is, is, is pretty amazing. They love it. This is Swan Canyon, uh, in, also in City Heights. Uh, there are middle school students and Hamilton Elementary school students right there adjacent to that canyon, walking distance, and so it was a no-brainer to connect uh, those, those students into that canyon to help restore it. And this slope, too, in Swan Canyon is now coastal sage scrub habitat today. Um, why? Why is a great question. Because it's important for our health, the canyons and their trees and their vegetation help filter our urban our uh, air and, and, and uh, clean our air, you know? Clean air, clean water. Um, if we can restore the natural vegetation and the natural filtration values of our canyons, we can slow that runoff down, we can absorb it into the water with the deep-rooted native plants absorbing, that water follows those roots into the ground, we can filter the pollutants out, and it's a healthier ecosystem right from the canes and the communities that you live in all the way to the coast. Maybe there'll be a day after we, after we restore all of our canes that we don't have to close the beaches after every rain. Right? It's polluted runoff, really, that's, that's causing us to close our beaches. So it's, it's an important to the health of our lagoons and our coastal waters as well, because as you saw, it's a watershed. This is Switzer Canyon. This is where it all began. The natives of the Switzer Canyon came to the Sierra Club, knocked on our door, and said, they're going to put roads in our canyons to maintain the sewer infrastructure that's in the canyons. And this is a view from the 30th Street Bridge looking out west toward downtown San Diego. There, and, I, and I was there with Sunset Magazine on an interview, uh, standing on that 30th Street Bridge. I was talking to them about the endangered species that are here, and a gnat catcher came flitting up, just right on cue. And, and so it gave me the idea for our logo. That's downtown San Diego right here. And of course, the bird that saved the West is right there, immortalized. <laughs> so. This is Stevenson Canyon up in Claremont. Dozens of canyons in all of our neighborhoods. You know, we, it's huge, huge challenges. This is the riparian corridor. Anybody know what, what non-native plant species that is? Castor bean, right? Uh, this, you know, it's a, it's a battle. Pampas grass, unbelievable challenge to, to, to remove pampas grass. But we're doing it, and we're telling people, hey, these are problematic plant species that are hurting our biodiversity and, and, and impacting our canyons. Um, Arundo donax, uh, that, that was prevalent in many of our canyons, and we have, it's a really tough one to battle, but we have done it. We've, we've eradicated it in Olivia Canyon in City Heights and a few others, but it, you can see how incredibly invasive it is and what a huge challenge it is to restore uh, the canyons. Um, not a lot of species appreciate the Arundo donax. They use it for wildlife habitat or, and that kind of thing. Um, and advocacy, you know, we need to, we need to continue to say this is important to us. San Diegans love their neighborhood canyons, and biodiversity is important for a number of reasons. Biodiversity and health, that's a whole nother discussion that's happening upstairs. Um, but but we, need, we need to solve the erosion problems. We need to slow our runoff down. We need to capture the runoff. Um, 
we need to, you know, stop developing on the slopes so that we don't have incredible erosion and, and impacts to our uh, steep hillsides, which are an incredible, unique part of our geography. Obviously, we need to get rid of invasive plant species. That's, that's a hillside of pure ice plant. It will grow up and crush all of our coastal sage scrub to the ground and just displace it. Um, this is Rose Canyon, and, and you can see that there was a great deal of advocacy that went into protecting Rose Canyon from yet another bridge and, and being bifurcated by another uh, four or six lane road, I forget what it was, Regents Road. Um, and this was one of the advocacy postcards that they sent out. This or this? Okay, so erosion, erosion is a really tough one because as we paved our urban environment, we've created impermeable surfaces, and so we're funneling that water into storm drains, and very often, most often, most of our urban runoff is funneled through storm drains into our canyons on the way to the coast. So as we continue to develop over the years and decades, the more impermeable surfaces, the less absorbent, the more velocity and volume of water being funneled through the canyons, and it's caused incision of those channel creeks. So we need to create, and that's what we're trying to do is create a toolkit of solutions to stabilize our streams with gray controls and slowing the runoff down and allowing it to slow down and spread across the floodplain. Plant trees and native vegetation to, to sew up those soils and keep those soils in the canyon. Otherwise, we're, we're sending it down into San Diego Bay, attached with pollutants and everything else on those uh, sediment particles, uh, and again, causing more environmental problems downstream as well as in the canyon. Um, again, the bird that saved the West, um, the little songbird, I'm gonna write that, that's gonna be a children's book, right? The little bird that saved the West, yes. Horned lizards, um, you know, they tell me that horned lizards were in all of our canyons at one time. I, I've only seen them in a few places. Rose Canyon is one of them, very few places. Um, and this, is, this shows you how our canyons are spread out throughout the city and we've created these friends groups. These are the names of some of our friends groups and, and uh, we get together in a coalition to share resources. Um, how much time do I have? Okay, excellent. Um, these are our watersheds and as I press the clicker, the, uh, the canyons will populate these watersheds. Does that give you an idea of how each of these watersheds are literally sprinkled with, with uh, canyons. So uh, they are all through our urban environment, communities and neighborhoods, accessible for nature classrooms and, and a hike and an enjoyment of nature. Um, we were able to dedicate some 13,200 acres of city-owned open space. Uh, we got that job done by 2013 with the help of Senator Keogh, Senator Atkins, and, uh, and Todd Gloria and a few others. Uh, they helped us with state legislation to do that. So we have protected a good lot of our, our open space with uh, the dedication of it. And uh, that's how we wanted to create, and we will the Canyonlands Regional Park. That was Richard Liu's idea. Um, this, these, this shows the land in yellow here and these, that we were able to dedicate uh, by the end of 2012 and 13. So this is a history of it. We, one of the, the key politicians was Mayor Sanders that helped us get, get the job done. Um, again, there it is, 2013 some, uh, an additional 6,500 acres. By that point, we were at 13,200. So, um, so then we started a program, Canyon Enhancement Planning, so that we can get into the neighborhoods, we can talk about the values, we do some outreach, and, and, and map the canyons, the existing conditions in the canyons. So build the stewardship, map the existing conditions, community stakeholder planning workshops, uh, and, and, and create an action plan out of these workshops. We're in the middle of doing that right now in 12 canyons throughout uh, the city. Um, and then seek the money and, and the permits to, to implement the action plans. You know, it's easy to get permits to restore canyons. Um, th they are, uh, 
it's it's CEQA exempt, right? You're restoring habitat. So the rest of it should fall in place. We have a master permit with the city of San Diego for right of entry to, to uh, restore and, and actually build trails as well when needed uh, throughout the city. That's a really handy, uh, streamlined way to get work done. And there we are with some city planners doing the mapping. And look at this, Debbie Knight, the champion of Rose Canyon right there. Um, here we go. Uh, this is one of our um, social infrastructure maps that shows the city-owned land here in uh, Swan Cane and City Heights and, and, and uh, the various myriad of trails, social trails generally. What can we do to provide trails and then restore some of this back to habitat? These maps are part of our Canyon Enhancement planning process. We pull together the stakeholders and we make plans. This is Switzer Canyon. And, and we just do call outs about what, what we're going to do. Control erosion, provide a trail here, provide a trail there. We got some trail proposals down off of 30th in Switzer. And then go to work and find the money, uh, state money, to implement the plans. Um, this is a zoom in on some of the, uh, the 30th Street corridor bifurcating um, Switzer Canyon. We show, it shows the property ownerships and the slopes. And a brush management zone is a big deal. What can we do with our brush management zones? Do we, do we just clear it? That sometimes I hear that word and it, it gives me cringes. If you clear the, the, the vegetation in the 100 feet from your, your structure down into the canyon, you're going to denude the slope and you're going to have erosion. Or you're going to create a highway for invasive annuals that grow this high every year, like mustard, right? And, 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 and have to you know, two, two or three times a year um, do brush management in that zone. So native plants, slow-growing, low-growing native plants are a solution for our brush management zones. We want to try and, and, and get that out there. There's habitat value, but also fire safety and a lot less uh, management required when you do native vegetation in the brush management zone. There are ways. Um, this is Manzanita Canyon, an example of erosion where we had a social trail that has caused erosion coming up and down beside the fence on the western end of Manzanita Canyon. And we went in there with the rangers and we created a plan and the stakeholders got together. The Urban Corps helped us refurbish this, this uh, slope right here and then installed this Ranger Sue Pelly. Does anybody remember Ranger Sue Pelly? All right, there she is. We, we, we worked with her in a planning effort. It's part of our Canyon Enhancement Planning. And we, and we wound up installing these steps to uh, then provide safe and sustainable access to the canyons. There's Last Child in the Woods. Richard Louv is an incredible advocate and champion for, and, and, and did a host of studies that tell us why it's important that we have access to nature during our formative years so that we understand it, but it, it, it builds cognitive uh, capabilities and, and um, it's a real resource uh, for kids to have access to nature and, and uh, it's a pretty amazing book, you should read it. Um, there's Manzanita Canyon, um, we, it's, just, it's one of the, the uh, underserved recreational area, underserved uh, locations, city heights uh, and, and so we were able to connect um, this is the Hoover High School Eco Club that came out. And um, the leader of the Hoover High School Eco Club, Rudy Vargas, is now uh, a policy advisor with Kamala Harris. So, so these kids, they get connected to nature and they go up the ladder and, it, and it's, it's really cool. It was, that was a great relationship to make, but collaborations with the eco clubs and the high schools, that's a great way to do it. Um, there, there they are, there's the eco club at Swan Canyon removing non-native grasses. That is now too restored to coastal sage scrub there. Um, again, uh, Aquatic Ad Adventures became Ocean Discovery Institute, and they now have a beautiful living lab on the north end of Manzanita Canyon in City Heights. If you haven't gone there, you should visit it. Um, and they're just taking it, you know, the, the value of our education, the opportunities to use our canyons as a nature classroom to the just it's just amazing it's what a wonderful partnership that is and uh this was back when they were aquatic adventures and now they've grown to ocean discovery institute and it's amazing yeah kids love it they're fascinated they fascinate us too don't they when they're out there 
So this is just a list of the, of the collaborations. Uh, the San Diego River Conservancy has been helping us in that watershed for a very long time. Uh, we're now trying to uh, get more attention for the Pueblo watershed and the underserved communities there. Um, but REI businesses, uh, all the nonprofits, I Love a Clean has been amazing. Um, partnering with SDG&E uh, in, in a number of locations. Uh, they support our work. Uh, over the years, they've donated to our, our organization. Um, so so this is, this is um, our Cane Enhancement Planning Committee. Uh, Vicki Estrada, Andy Spurlock, folks that are into urban planning, but also into understanding our environment and making sure we're integrated well. It's about connections. Can we connect people to nature? Can we help people understand the value and protect it? And this, we did a white paper in 2006, and um, from that, we, we uh, have, have uh, gathered people together to create action plans for restoring their canyons in 12 urban canyons. Um, so we, we know it's a system, and, and, and those are the kinds of connections we're trying to make across the urban landscape to, to link canyons together. In City Heights, we linked four urban canyons together to create a five-mile loop trail system, nature uh, loop trail system. And we can connect that to Choyas Creek in the south, and it'll be an eight-mile uh, trail system for City Heights. Pretty amazing. And the idea is, you know, plant native trees along the streetscapes to connect, to create canyon corridors, for corridors for wildlife. We talk about biodiversity. The canyons are stepping stones for mobile species. Um, we, we have coyotes in North Park, you know, and, and we, have, we have bird species that, since we're in the Pacific Flyway, the bird species stop in and we can see them in our neighborhoods, in our canyons, and, and, and along, of course along the, the amazing coast that we have. Um, so, linking things in, we're, we're creating a strategic plan. We have a knowledgeable board of directors, an amazing, dedicated board of directors. We have we have a three-year uh, term, but since we opened our doors 11 years ago uh, as a nonprofit, San Diego Canyon Lands uh, board of directors have kind of waived that three years. They're all still uh, on board <laughs> as <a> directors, <laughs> and I've just joined the board of directors. Um, so create those canyon friends groups, foster stewardship, establish the nature classrooms with the local schools and, and youth groups, uh, participate in enhance, canyon enhancement planning, create, create a, a canyon, uh, Canyonlands Park. Uh, we're still trying to do that. And, uh, and support, you know, this is, this is how you can all help. We're, we're gonna get somewhere on this. Uh, there's, the, there's the 11, 45 canyon friends groups. Um, the white paper we talked about, the 13,000 acres we talked about. We've we involve about 1,000 youth per year and about 1,200 uh, volunteers per year. Um, and, there's, and there's a whole host of our um, incredible collaborators and supporters. Um, this is Miranda Hildahl. She is an associate director. She's running it now. And we have Clayton Schutte now, who hails from CNPS, taking my, my spot. And there's Carrie Schneider. She's been the president of San Diego Canyonlands since we opened our doors. And she was there at the Sierra Club in 1999 with the, with the group from North Park that helped us uh, establish um, the Canyons campaign under the Sierra Club banner. There's Clayton. I wish he was here. He's, he's uh, abroad. He's, he's on a trip to India. <laughs> Where is he? He's in India, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. And so, and anyways, he's he's a fantastic executive director. I'm I'm really jazzed that we were able to put him in the seat. Um, thank you very much from San Diego Canyonlands for all you do out there. I a lot of familiar faces. I know you love your neighborhood canyons. Thanks for all you're doing. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Sarah Allen. Let's see. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Allen, and I am the MSCP biologist for the City of San Diego's Parks and Recreation Department's Open Space Division. We've had a great session this afternoon discussing the importance of San Diego's unique urban preserve system 
And now the critical question becomes, how do we successfully manage these urban preserves so that we protect sensitive species that rely on them while still providing these opportunities for our children and future generations to experience the wonders of nature? So here we are situated in Southwest California, and this is the county of San Diego, and the city of San Diego uh, is located within the southwest corner of um, the county, and highlighted in black here are our urban preserves. Now, our mandate, or our organic act, if you will, is the Multiple Species Conservation Program. The MSCP is an adopted federal habitat conservation plan under the Endangered Species Act and an adopted natural communities conservation plan under the state of California's Natural Communities Conservation Planning Act. This program was driven by development interest in the early to mid 90s following the listing of the California gnat catcher. That photo has been shown a few times today already. As a regional HCP, the MSCP confers third-party beneficiary status for the take of endangered species on development projects permitted by the city of San Diego in exchange for codified mitigation within our planned habitat preserve. The city also adopted the Vernal Pool Habitat Conservation Plan in 2018, which expands upon the MSCP by conserving highly sensitive vernal pool complexes within the city. Our framework management plan includes these five dictates to ensure long-term viability and function of our local ecosystems, to protect the preserve from disturbing activities while accommodating pub co compatible public recreational uses, to enhance and restore our sensitive habitats and provide functional corridors to the conserved lands, to monitor our populations, and to adaptively manage our preserve to address current and future threats. Currently, our preserve system includes almost 51,000 acres, of which 27,000 acres are open to the public. And on those 20, or 51,000 acres, we have 85 rare, threatened, or endangered species, a total of 178 trailheads, and 225 trail miles. And this is what it looks like. We have beautiful hillsides covered in ceanothus, foothill streams with willows and sycamore, vernal pools on top of mesas, and boulder co co covered slopes covered in snow, occasionally. <laughs> we also have a handful, well, more than a handful of sensitive species that rely on these habitats, such as the California gnat catcher, coastal cactus wren, western burrowing owl, horned lizard, spadefoot toad, and fairy shrimp. Uh, this is just a handful of our sensitive plants, variegated dudlia, San Diego thornment, otai tar plant, shortleaf dudlia, coast wallflower, orcutts brodea. And all this looks great, right? Well, did any of you notice something missing from all those photos? Our urban preserve actually looks like this. And this is what a lot of our areas look like. They're right on the edge of development. And as my colleague Eric noted in the last presentation, we have open space canyons and urban preserves in nearly all of our neighborhoods in San Diego. So as you can imagine, this leads to a lot of people venturing into these areas. But the question we had was how many? In 2016, the city partnered with San Diego State University and the Conservation Biology Institute to conduct a park use study to shed light on just how many people were use, utilizing our open space preserves. This study surveyed just 12 trailheads out of the 178 that we have. And on those tra 11 trailheads, sorry, on those 11 trailheads, 2,321,564 visits were counted. That's a lot. But the good news is that this use is not constant across all the sites, and about three of those trailheads accounted for 77% of the use. So you can't just multiply that study total by 10 and say that it represents the total usage. 
However, we were able to do a little bit of extrapolation and uh, estimated the use for all 178 trailheads. And I say potentially inappropriate because we did make a lot of assumptions here. Um, we figured that we have along the lines of approximately 7 million annual visits over the 27,000 acres that are open to the public. Believe it or not, these numbers are greater than the Grand Canyon, Yosemite, or Yellowstone. <laughs> Based on those, no oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, from our perspective as scientists, uh, that's pretty stunning. Uh, luckily, we've also learned that our politicians and decision makers are also stunned by these numbers, but in a good way. Uh, to be honest, what actually drove the study in the first place was our desire to have open space be recognized as the public asset that it really is, but we were finding it difficult to communicate this value to our community. However, when politicians and decision makers can see that our open space areas have a similar draw as the Padres and the zoo, they start to take notice. So what are all these people doing in our parks? And where are they visiting from? Well, it turns out most are visiting from around the corner, across the street, um, or just a few miles across town. Uh, we actually have a very invested group of local users who use our parks daily or weekly or monthly. And they are hikers, mountain bikers, bird watchers, rock climbers, trail runners, equestrians, and families. And all that's wonderful, but believe it or not, there are other things that people do in our canyons and open spaces. Some people like to live in them. Some people like to do other things in them. Uh, some people like to express their artistic side. Some people like to light them on fire. And everyone lets their dogs poop in them. So these are all things that, for the most part, you don't learn about in your classes for biology or natural resource management degrees. Um, <laughs> these are also issues that, in many case are, cases, are significantly different from those faced by larger, more remote parks, such as those managed by the National Park Service. And so as a city, we realize we have a huge job on our hands. And the only way that we feel that we can successfully manage all those people on our landscapes is with people. Currently, our Parks and Recreation Open Space Division employs six senior park rangers and 20 park rangers. All of these rangers work tirelessly to ensure the protection of our natural resources while also providing safe and beautiful opportunities for recreation. Our open space team, in addition to our senior park rangers and park rangers, also consists of two pesticide applicators that help with our invasive species issues, a district manager, two grounds maintenance workers, one grounds maintenance manager, two senior planners, two environmental biologists, and two student interns. And these are just some of the things that our rangers uh, do on a daily basis. Um, from wrangling escaped horses, dealing with flood issues, <laughs> dealing with vandalism and uh, illegal access issues, trail work and repairing erosion, issuing citations for unlawful activity, and our rangers work with the San Diego Police Department on all sorts of issues relating to law enforcement. They engage the community and lead nature hikes and uh, school-based curriculum programs. And they also get the community and kids involved in restoration projects. So I'm probably running out of time here. <laughs> Not sure. Um, but. Here are some highlights from our 2019 um, management actions, MSCP management actions report, which um, has not been published yet, but should be available on the city website in a month or so, probably. Um, this year, over 240,000 pounds of trash were removed from the San Diego River. 32 tons of trash were removed from non-active encampment sites in the Otay River. 
1,900 volunteers dedicated over 10,000 hours to clean up, restoration, and park beautification activities. Our open space staff removed over 3,100 cubic yards of invasive species from Otay Valley Regional Park. And at Mission Trails Park alone, 6,473 students participated in ranger-led curriculum-based school programs. Now this is just a handful of bullet points from a report that's actually about 40 pages long. Uh, and this report will be posted on the city's website in about a month if you would like to read the whole thing. Um, these are just a few tidbits, a teaser. <laughs> And so I just want to wrap up by stressing that the reason our park rangers know when and where all of these issues are and what needs to be done to fix them is because they are out patrolling their parks every day, day in, day out, all the time. They're talking to park patrons, scanning police and fire frequencies on their radios, and making informed and quick decisions that will help keep our parks safe and functional for both human visitors and for the plant and animal species that depend on our parks. It's an honor and a privilege for me to be able to work alongside all of these park rangers, and I believe it's cru crucial to get the word out about park rangers and their role in land management, especially in urban areas. And that's all, thank you. <laughs> So I'm going to uh, conclude the session today by talking about biodiversity in San Diego Canyon. So I'm going to focus on insect diversity, which is my uh, area of expertise. And I'm going to focus particularly on, on ants and bees. And I'll explain a little bit about why I'm going to uh, talk about ants and bees uh, in a second. First, I wanted to just mention the, the history of work in the San Diego Canyons from an academic perspective. In uh, 1988, uh, Michael Soule and colleagues uh, published a paper on how habitat loss and fragmentation affects uh, resident breeding bird species in scrub habitats. This is a map of uh, San Diego that shows the canyons that many of you are familiar with. And this uh, study appeared during a period of time in conservation biology when uh, academic researchers were, were very interested in trying to understand the effects of habitat loss and fragmentation on uh, plants and animals, uh, how big of an area do you need to preserve in order for species to persist? Do areas need to be connected together? This particular study was, was influential uh, in its own right. It's, it's been widely cited. It also, from a more local uh, perspective, stimulated research by a number of people who uh, continue to work in the canyons and study uh, the biodiversity that uh, does remain. And so I just wanted to, to mention this study at the introduction uh, to my talk. There have been uh, many PhD dissertations that have come from this original uh, publication. So I'm going to focus on, on ants and bees. These are insects in the, the order Hymenoptera. And the main point that I want to emphasize is that these are, are abundant insects. They're familiar to you all, at least on a, on a superficial level. And they're also ecologically important. So ants are are important scavenging predators. They participate in a variety of uh, mutualisms, protection mutualisms and dispersal mutualisms. They're also prey for a variety of animals, both invertebrates and invertebrates. And bees, of course, are important because they provide uh, pollination services. And we're, we're used to thinking of that in, in agricultural settings. And in fact, they provide very important pollination services in non-managed ecosystems as well, such as the, the scrub habitats that are in, in many of the local canyons here. So we have about 275 species of ants in California. It's not a particularly diverse uh, assemblage of species, but there is a fairly high level of endemism. So ants that are restricted to the California floristic province, and some of those species have declined as a result of habitat loss and, and destruction. These are some common ant species that you can, you can still find in, in parts of coastal San Diego County. Uh, in the, the upper left are are fire ants, they're native fire ants. We also have the red imported fire ant in San Diego, but thankfully it's not very widespread. The ant in the upper right is a harvester ant in the genus Pogonomirmax. These are ants that 
prey on seeds and also store seeds in their nest and disperse seeds of plants. The bottom left is a carpenter ant. Uh, this genus is, is uh, cosmopolitan and, and very diverse and includes many of the endemic species uh, in California. And on the bottom right is a, is a field ant in the genus Formica. And these are ants that uh, are conspicuous uh, in many parts of California. They're actually the most diverse genus of ant in California. And you can see this worker is uh, tending aphids. And it's an example of a protection mutualism. So the ant protects the aphid, and then the aphid gives the ant uh, food in the form of honeydew. Oops. So unfortunately, the, the Argentine ant uh, is, is widespread throughout coastal California, especially central and, and southern California. This is a major form of, of biotic uh, impoverishment. Uh, the Argentine ant is an invader from South America and it displaces native ants. I'll show you some examples of that displacement. Thankfully, the invasion is, is limited somewhat by dry conditions and freezing temperatures. So they don't occur statewide, but in coastal ecosystems, they're, they're the most conspicuous ant in urban areas and also in landscapes that have uh, suitable abiotic conditions, which would include many places on the, on the California coastline. So grassland habitats, scrub habitats, and riparian habitats. This uh, drawing was made by uh, Jennifer Z, who was my, my very first uh, graduate student and worked in the museum after she finished her, uh, her master's degree. And it, it, it captures the displacement of native ants um, very dynamically. You can see the Argentine ants invading the coastline and the, the native ants. Uh, in full retreat. You might be familiar with the Argentine ant because it's an urban pest. If you have ants in your house, I would wager that they're Argentine ants. This uh, slide is a, is a historical resurvey of about 100 urban areas in San Diego that my grad student Sean Menke and I uh, conducted. We looked for Argentine ants in, in 2006 and then went back about 10 years later to see if they were still there. And, Perhaps this isn't a huge surprise, but they were still there in most cases. So the black circles are, are urban habitats where there were ants um, throughout this 10-year period. There aren't very many data sets that look at the long-term presence of introduced species, so that's why this is of interest. I'm showing this mainly just to show how widespread this ant is in San Diego. This uh, slide shows uh, the displacement of native ants in, in Rice Canyon, which is a canyon that's down in Chula Vista. It parallels Telegraph uh, Avenue. And uh, in, the, in the upper left, you can see the, the uh, first year that the Argentine ant was found in, in Rice Canyon. And the open squares show the, the spread of that species uh, year by year. So. So this is a 1996, it had just gotten to the canyon. Um, by 1997, it had spread a little bit further. Uh, by 1998, it was about halfway down the canyon. And then by 2003, it was all the way down on the, the bottom of the canyon. The open circles show the number of native ant species in this canyon. And you can see by the, by the end of the Argentine ant spread that um, native ant diversity was, was completely suppressed uh, in Rice Canyon. And this is a, a pattern that, that unfortunately has repeated itself over and over again uh, in many parts of coastal California. Oops. We've also documented this displacement on the, on the Channel Islands. Um, the, the dark arrows show uh, the year in which the Argentine ant arrived on uh, long-term study plots that we have on Santa Cruz and San Clemente Islands. And you can see that the, the year the Argentine ant invaded, uh, native ant diversity dropped. And you see this wherever, uh, wherever the Argentine ant was, uh, was found. We've also done historical resurveys in some of these sites to see if the effects of the displacement persist over time. Some introduced species come in, they get really common, they interact with native species, but then they disappear for reasons which are, are sometimes not uh, clear. And at least in California ecosystems over the past 20 years, it seems like the, the effects of this invasion are enduring. They do persist over time. This is uh, Rice Canyon again, which is the site that I, I just told you about. And this is the the number of native ant species in the entire canyon, it's a little hard to see 
on this graph, but this is 2003, and this is 15 years later in 2017, and you can see that the diversity is really uh, still at a very low level. So, so native ant diversity went from, from almost 20 species down to just a few species, and it seems to have persisted at that time. This is Argentine ants in the canyon as well, and they, they are, are clearly persisting. The, the y-axis here is abundance, so it looks like the Argentine ants getting more abundant, but um, 2017 was a wet year, and we think they're just, uh, they were more common that year in part because the winter was favorable. So um, canyons in San Diego lose most of their native ant species as a direct result of the displacement of the Argentine ant, and this is a, a really unfortunate fact. And one can only hope that in the long term, uh, the Argentine ants succumbs to some pathogen or we're able to develop a control strategy that's targeted just to that species that might allow the recovery of, of native ants. I now want to turn to, to bees, and I'll talk about bees for the rest of this uh, presentation. And when you think of bees, you, you likely think of, of honeybees. They're the most conspicuous uh, bee species uh, in, in many parts of California. And honeybees, of course, are non-native. They're introduced from from Europe and, and uh, Africa. That's where Apis mellifera uh, is, is from. And the southwestern part of North America is really special because we have um, uh, many native species of bees. In fact, in San Diego County, we have over 600 species and over 1,000 species in California. Uh, the southwestern part of the continent, like I said, is a, is a biodiversity hotspot. Many of these species are uh, Solitary, honeybees of course are social. Uh, solitary bees are active typically for a relatively short period of time. They oftentimes uh, specialize on particular uh, host plants. So they may not be as uh, conspicuous as honeybees, but they can be very important pollinators uh, of our native plants, even if they're relatively uh, uncommon. So uh, my grad student, James, my former grad student, James Hung and I, uh, conducted a study throughout the 2010s on uh, native bee diversity in canyons in, in San Diego. And uh, what we found was something that was, was rather interesting. There, there is a reduction in, in bee diversity in fragmented landscapes, and you can see that in this graph uh, on the right. This is um, fragment sites in two different years, 2011 and 2012. But look at the y-axis, you can see that um, on average, there were still about 40 bee species, or, or 20 bee species, depending on the year, um, in, these, in these fragments, which is, which is encouraging. That means that a lot of these native species are uh, persisting, or apparently persisting, in these uh, fragmented landscapes. It's, it's also worth noting that the, the diversity really drops from 2011 and 2012, and this is, this is not a population level decline, we don't think. It's just the fact that 2012 was a much drier year than, than 2011. So in years when there are a lot of native plants in bloom, those are good years for native bees. Those resources persist into the next year in the form of, of bees from the past generation. And abundance and diversity varies from year to year depending on, on rainfall. So fragmentation has an effect, but bees are still clearly uh, in the landscape, which is encouraging. We've also looked at the, the changes in bee assemblages and fragments uh, in uh, some detail. Uh, and I, I don't want to um, talk about these results too much, but, but this graph just shows the, the diversity, which takes into account the relative abundance of different species. And again, there's a difference between uh, fragments and, and reserve sites, uh, unfragmented scrub habitat. And then we also looked at functional diversity. So this is a, a, a way to statistically assess how the, the habits of the bees, their, their diets, their body sizes, which influence how far they can fly, the period of year in which they're active, the kinds of plants that they visit. Um, it's a way to summarize all of that variation in a, in a single number. And you can see that, that functional diversity um, also drops um, between um, unfragmented scrub habitat and, and fragmented scrub habitat like you'd find in a typical canyon. This is a little bit alarming because functional diversity um, is presumably important for the pollination services that native bees provide. And if that, if that functional diversity is decreasing, then, then it's possible that the services that the pollination assemblage in aggregate is providing might decrease as a consequence. We've looked in a little bit of detail in, into why bees are, are not able to 
survive in, in fragmented landscapes. This is a study that was published by uh, a master's student of mine um, named Amanda Shockett, and she looked at, at the fuzzy megafauna. These are, these are bumblebees that are familiar to everybody, I'm sure. These are um, social uh, bees. And bumblebees are typically more common and more diverse in northern environments. We're right at the southern edge of the distribution of most uh, most of the bumblebee species uh, that occur here. And we sampled bumblebees in a variety of different environments, urban environments, canyons, and, and unfragmented sites, uh, to see if we could figure out what landscape level correlates were associated with their uh, abundance. This is a table just showing the, the three different bumblebees that I showed you in the previous slide. The proportion of, of reserve sites that they were at, the proportion of fragments or canyons that they were at, and then the proportion of urban sites that you were at, that they were at. And you can see that they very clearly drop out of uh, urban sites, especially Californicus and, and Melanopygus. In terms of landscape level predictors of occurrence, um, two of the three species were, were negatively associated with impermeable surface cover. Not a particularly surprising result, given the fact that these are ground nesting bees that, that primarily forage on native plants. So if you cover an area with a parking lot, um, they don't have any place to, to live and they don't have any food to, to feed on. Bombus californicus, inter interestingly enough, was positively correlated with sage cover, and this included sage cover in, in people's yards, so Cleveland sage and black sage, white sage that are, are planted as, as ornamental plants increasingly in California. And that was, that was interesting and suggests that um, the kinds of plants that people plant in their garden might be important for uh, persistence at a landscape scale. I also wanted to mention uh, the potential importance of, of honeybees. Honeybees, of course, are, are incredibly important pollinators in agricultural systems. Many of the crops that we that we grow in, in profusion in California depend on honeybees for, for pollination services. However, they, they are a non-native species and they're very abundant in our local ecosystems. And, and that, that abundance is really captured in the slide, um, which shows that the visitation frequency of all of the insect species that we found visiting this one species of plant, this is clustered uh, tarweed, Dinandra fasciculata, which is a very common uh, tarweed that blooms in the late spring and summer. And you can see that um, honeybees, which are the, the, the bar in the far left here, um, made up the vast majority of all visits uh, to this one plant species. The rest of these uh, visits were all made by, by native insects. And we found 70 species of, of native insects. I'm sure if we kept sampling, we would have continued to find more and more. The abundance of honeybees in our landscape means that the nectar and pollen that these, these insects are collecting um, is, is not available for, for native insects. So it's almost certainly the case that honeybees are important exploitative competitors with, with native pollinators. Whoops. So I just wanted to conclude with this, this table talking about the, the differences in, in biodiversity of these two important insect groups uh, in the canyons. Unfortunately, the news for ants is, is negative, at least as long as the Argentine ant is, is in the system. Um, it will continue to suppress uh, native ant diversity. Uh, these other factors like the isolation of a canyon, the diversity of native plants, nest site limitation, as long as the Argentine ant is present, they're really gonna explain uh, very little variation in the persistence of, of native ants. For bees, the, the message is a little bit more encouraging in that there are a lot of native species that persist, even in degraded, isolated uh, habitats. And the, the species that decline, it's, it's a little bit unclear why they're, they're missing from these landscapes. Uh, the, the findings that we found for bumblebees suggest that, that native plants might play uh, a role in, in their persistence uh, in urban landscapes and canyon, canyons in uh, San Diego County. Um, it's, it's also likely that multiple factors explain uh, the absence of those species where they have, uh, where they have dropped out. So that's all, that's all I had to say today, and we'll uh, take questions as a panel uh, right now. Sarah mentioned that of the f over 50,000 acres of preserved land in San Diego County, there's only 27,000 open to the public. What are the rest of them? Yes. 
So uh, some of the, it's not necessarily parkland. Uh, there are other open space areas managed by other departments like the Public Utilities Department uh, manages land around the reservoirs and Marone Valley, uh, Barrett Lake, um, areas like that. And so they manage a lot, a lot of the uh, other acreage. Um, there's other land that's, uh, let's see, owned by Environmental Services Department. Um, and the airports uh, that would be also included in the MSCP, uh, within the MHPA area, um, but is not necessarily open to the public to, tribal oh, tribal lands too, good. <laughs> Other questions? I actually have a request more than a question. Um, and this came up in a couple of comments that you all made. I would love to see this community um, stop using the term brush. Because when we talk about brush and brush control, that degrades the um, value of native plants. And if we all lead the way in referring to those areas as habitat areas, then we will go a long way in changing, I think, the public's perspective. And this is a really good community to start doing that. So that's, that's my little comment. Eric, do you have any comments or feedback on that? I, I think that's a great point. I, um, you would have us say uh, coastal sage scrub uh, and or vegetation as opposed to brush, because I, I agree. Yeah, I cringe every time I see um, advertisements about um, vegetation management. I'm getting there. And, and, um, and they talk about clearing uh, 100 feet from the homes. It's, uh, it's really not a good idea. And, and uh, so our vegetation, our native vegetation with its deep roots is holding that slope together, isn't it? Um, and, and preventing erosion and collapse of hillsides, which could threaten, say, some of the homes that are you know, on, the, on the canyon slopes. So very good point. Vegetation it is. Great, thank you. Other questions? Oh, yep. Um, this question is for David Holloway. Um, would you, were you saying the non-native bees, like the honeybees, were very um, prevalent and maybe causing a change in native species? like increasing the amount of tarweed potentially because they're out there pollinating certain species? Would you, do you think it's changed some of the plant biodiversity? Yeah, so th that's an excellent question. There's a, there's a phenomenal amount of information known about the effectiveness of honeybees as, as pollinators in agricultural systems. And that's, of course, driven by the, the economic importance of crop species that depend on honeybees for pollination. In California, the almond is, is a great example. It's an incredibly lucrative crop that's totally dependent on, on honeybees pollination. What's astonishing is that in natural systems, uh, very little is known about the effectiveness of honeybees as pollinators. They are super generalists, so they visit many different plant species. They tend to visit plants that are, are abundant in, and in bloom at the same time. So they, they shift their preferences throughout the, the season, but they tend to go to species that are the most common species at any one time. And their effectiveness as pollinators uh, must vary, but it's, it's only seldom been measured. So th there really isn't an answer to your question. In the tarweed study, uh, we did look at, at pollinator effectiveness in that we experimentally removed honeybees from some uh, flowers. And what we found was that even though honeybees were by far and away the most common visitor to tarweed, they, they didn't seem to contribute much in terms of pollination services. So, the, so even if you removed all the honeybees, the plants still set um, almost as many seeds as if honeybees uh, were present. That would suggest that, that honeybees aren't doing much for that particular plant species. What they're doing for all the other plants in the ecosystem is, is a good question and is, is not known. And it's, it's really a remarkable gap in our understanding. Hey, Dave, um, another question. Um, do you, 
Are feral bees, the feral honeybees, have that bee disease that kills off the bees, and, and do they transmit it to the native bees? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. You've probably all heard about honeybee declines, uh, especially in, in agricultural systems uh, throughout the country, and in many parts of the United States, uh, domesticated honeybees that are used in agriculture are declining. Uh, apiculture has, is harder and harder to do commercially uh, because of pathogens and, and other problems that bees are experiencing. What's interesting about those news stories is that they seem to ignore the fact that in the Southwest, uh, there are feral populations of honeybees that are, are really quite abundant. And, and so it's, it's very different than what you see in most parts of the, most other parts of the, the United States. To, to answer your question about whether feral bees are, are less susceptible to pathogens that are afflicting domesticated honeybees, it's, it's not really clear. Uh, in, in part because there's no money in it. So uh, people who are interested in, in honeybee health are focusing on honeybees and agricultural systems. They're not focused on feral bees. But I think there's some really interesting research uh, that could be done looking at feral, feral honeybee populations. I have one more bee question. Um, so do you, with the, the tar plant study, do you think that the um, pollen is limiting in that the honeybees are taking it all, which then is minimizing the availability to the native bees? Well, it's presumably, just given how abundant honeybees are as visitors on that plant and many other plants uh, that, are, that are common in our landscape, it's very hard to show directly, though, that honeybees are causing the declines of, of native bees. Uh, and it's, it's difficult for a variety of reasons, uh, in large part because bees fly around. And so, so documenting a population level effect as a result of honeybees taking all the resources is, is difficult to do. The experiment that I, I would, the experiment that I dream of is, is removing honeybees from a landscape scale and, and seeing what happens to, to native bee populations over time. One of the places I work is Santa Cruz Island, which used to have honeybees but doesn't anymore. And it's, it's really striking how abundant uh, native bees are on Santa Cruz. Uh, and I, I suspect that if, if honeybees disappeared from our local ecosystems, that, that native bees would really increase in abundance. But showing that is, is a challenge. Uh, I have a question for Eric. I'm wondering what the um, canyons are that you guys are planning around and um, how citizens can get involved in that planning process. I live on Tecolote. All right, thank, thank you for that question. Uh, Tecolote, unfortunately, is not one of them. There are, there are 12 of them, I know, boo. Um, you do have a great um, Citizens Advisory Committee for Tecolote Canyon, do you know that? Um, and they, they do whatever, the planning, and, and they've been around a long time. We try not to step on toes. But uh, the 12 canyons that we're doing canyon enhancement planning for are um, Swan, Manzanita, 47th Street Canyon, uh, Hollywood Canyon, um, um, let's see, Maple, oh. <laughs> okay, I got about halfway through. If anybody else, if anybody else is dying to know the other six, you can ask that question again. Oh, you do want to know? Okay, Ruffin, <laughs> um, Rueda Canyon, Shepherd Canyon. Um, trying to think, uh, Mission Hills Canyon, um, and let's see, Florida Canyon. I'm getting pretty close. Uh, at any rate, the other ones will come to me. Um, I could just add that if you are interested in getting involved in uh, like volunteer work in any of our open space areas, uh, you can sign up to be a volunteer with the city of San Diego, and they'll connect you with the rangers for the areas that you want to work in. I wanted to connect uh, Eric and, and David's uh, two presentations uh, and, and to ask uh, Eric, how far do, I'm sorry, to ask David, how, how far do 
bees fly, and therefore kind of how effective are some of the strategies that Eric described in planning for, for corridors of native, of native plants or, or yard vegetation, how effective might that be for connecting populations between open space areas? Yeah, it's an excellent question, and, and, and bees uh, can fly long distances in some, some cases. To answer your first question, the, the distance bees fly is, is a little unclear. So people know how far honeybees fly because honeybees are so well studied. In general, there's a, a feeling that honeybees can forage up to a kilometer away from their, their colonies, sometimes further even. Large bee species like bumblebees and carpenter bees also use the landscape at a scale that is, you know, would resemble a vertebrate. They can fly hundreds and hundreds of meters. Many small bee species, though, are presumably really sedentary. So if they're specialists on rare host plants, if they have special nesting requirements, those aren't the bee species that you'd really expect to respond to you know, habitat corridors through, through urban areas or urban plantings. But for many bee species, especially ones that are, are more generalist and, and do have the capacity to fly over longer distances, um, I think uh, plantings and habitat corridors could could be a really exciting way to try to restore native bee diversity in in canyons. There was some evidence in our in our data we haven 't published it that canyons that had connectivity, even right of ways along roads and power lines um, had uh, more bee species than you 'd expect if the, than if the canyons were were isolated, and that suggests that these corridors could could play a role for at least some species uh, i 'm going to be selfish and follow up on that question did uh, Did you see within your declines were specialists more likely to drop out of fragments than um, non specialists That was our expectation and the, the bee species that systematically disappeared from fragments were a hodgepodge of species. It was very difficult to predict uh, the traits that would, would explain whether a species was present at a particular site. It was actually a little discouraging how difficult that was to do. Uh, this question is for Eric. Uh, Eric, you spoke about um, uh, stormwater runoff and control measures within the canyons to mitigate about stormwater. Are there, but stormwater starts in the streets, on the parking lots, that's where it starts. Are there efforts, are there any things that the municipalities or neighborhoods or cities can do to actually mitigate the stormwater at its source for the canyons? I, I think so. Um, you know, we got into this mess in terms of our stormwater getting funneled through our canyons and ever greater volumes and velocities little by little. So I believe that we can get out of that problem little by little as well. We can do a better job of con containing water where it falls, for example, at our homes. Uh, swales is, is a great way if you can, if you want to do, I have native plants in my front yard and I create little valleys around the native plants so water runs into those native plants. Um, I, I don't know how much that adds to connectivity and that kind of thing, but um, anything that we can do, rain barrels, rain barrel programs, um, what we're looking at with the city transportation and stormwater department, uh, we tried to use Maple Canyon as a um, pilot project, is to stabilize those streams with gray controls, a series of them, because maybe we can slow that runoff down and contain it within the canyon. And, and uh, try to recreate a wider floodplain, which right now with incised creek channels due to the severe erosion, that's all contained in a very narrow creek that just gets funneled through the canyon and down to the coast just as fast as it can flow. Anything we can do to slow it down and keep it in the canyon is, is really the strategies that we're looking at to slow runoff down and uh, stabilize the canyons and utilize that water for green infrastructure, right? Green infrastructure to absorb the urban runoff, filter it, clean our air, CO2 emissions. That's a great way to battle climate change. I'm told it, that planting trees and restoring wetlands, which are our riparian corridors, are a form of wetlands, is the most efficient way to battle climate change. Because if you plant a tree in a canyon, at some point in time, you don't have to 
provide supplemental water. It will grow its roots deep and survive on its own, and as it grows, it will continue to add to our um, canopy, our urban canopy, and uh, do its thing in terms of uh, carbon sequestration. So there's, there's a, um, a lot of things going on in the cane rather than outside, but anything that we can do, any ideas that people have, um, those are some of the thoughts that, that I come to mind. Hello. Um, I have a question about planning. So we heard earlier about one example of a community plan update, and I know there's lots of those that are going on or will be going on in the coming um, few years. So the the Canyonlands Park or what you the Canyonlands Enhancement Planning Programs or the efforts of the Natural History Museum and educators, how do all of those kind of fit together and how can they be brought into the community planning that's done by a lot of the people in this room and, and um, under the city's auspices? So what are the best ways to connect the value of urban canyons and other smaller canyons that aren't yet kind of recognized as um, uh, city open space? How do we bring those into the community planning process? All right, so as part of our um, canyon enhancement planning stakeholder process, we'll do outreach to the planning groups. We love it if we can get a member of the planning group to join us in that process and relay what's going on at the planning group level uh, to us as, in, in the stakeholder process um, and, then, and carry back to the planning group what it is that we're discussing it within a, a facilitated stakeholder process. Um, our outreach is neighborhood-wide uh, to, to get people engaged in that. Once we've got an action plan, we like to go up the ladder to the planning group, the town council, the council office, and, and gain support for it. Because the, most, the more support we have going up, up the ladder, the better chance we have of applying for a grant to get the work done. And we can point to that stakeholder process that created the plan and the support that we have. Always key, always, is our collaboration with the Open Space Division. They're the managers of our open space canyons, the city-owned land, and so they come to those. The, the rangers, Ranger Jason Allen and others, are attending those stakeholder meetings and, and providing input and guidance, and we don't step outside of what you know is feasible. Um, and, and with the city uh, support, the open space division support behind us, uh, we, we can get these things done. Generally, it fits with our community plan. Our general plan has great language in it. I helped years ago when we did a general plan update write some of the language that's in there about how important our canyons are to, uh, in terms of their resource values and preservation and protection of them is built into the city's general plan. So it, it is already integrated, but we go community by community to engage the local people that live around the canyons and, and other stakeholders to create an action plan for those canyons. Generally, it falls within uh, MSCP is, is a plan that we are always in consistency with because what are we doing? We're restoring the habitats in these degraded urban canyons. Did I answer the question? I have a question for the um, the whole panel, but particularly I'd like to hear from Mary and Eric about, uh, you know, I think a challenge for community engagement around, you know, anything that we do is, um, you know, ideas of inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. And um, what, what are your organizations doing to, you know, have a more inclusive process for uh, the efforts that you're doing. Those are some of our biggest challenges, especially in East County where we deal with a lot of minority populations and very um, different minority populations and underserved youth. And um, it's, a, it's a really, really big challenge. It requires a lot of effort, requires a lot of outreach going out in the community and actually making connections with different organizations and, and actually uh, churches and schools. And um, it requires a lot of backstory, a lot of back work, but it's well worth it. In, in communities like El Cajon, it's really starting to serve. There's other very underserved communities too, like in Spring Valley and stuff like that, but it's just an ongoing process and requires a lot of community support and a lot of outside support too. City Heights is 
the most diverse community, I think in the city, if not beyond. Um, and, and that is where our Canyon work began, you know, in earnest as a nonprofit in 2008, restoring those canyons and doing outreach, door-to-door -door outreach and bilingual outreach, uh, Spanish and English, and uh, inviting the neighbors and the students and, and, and any, anybody we could, you know, knock on their door to invite them, uh, church groups uh, and, and that type of thing. So, but we have seen, you know, fortunately, great engagement on the volunteer level in those neighborhood canyons, in the underserved community of City Heights and uh, other sections of the city um, where we've done that door-to-door -door outreach. It's really, it's diverse groups that are coming. It's just the same p kids and, and people that, you know, are going to the schools and working in that community, living in that community, they're coming. They're getting engaged, they're involved. Um, I, unfortunately, in terms of taking on some of the leadership roles, uh, like with San Diego Canyonlands, you know, we, we have Vicki Estrada on our board of directors, and, and uh, you know, it, we, we, need, we need to increase that, and we are really actively doing that. You know, uh, the door is open for those that are interested and want to, you know, bring their skills to, to our organization. We would love you to knock on our door and, and, and join us uh, in a leadership way, join our board. We definitely need a more diverse board. It is, it is uh, a challenge sometimes. It's Great, the way it is. thank you, Beth. We have time for one more question. I have a follow-on question on the, the canyons. Um, so a lot of the canyons geomorphologically are very, very flashy systems as far as water goes. They're, they're not places that water used to sit in the landscape. And with this ongoing 80s Egyptian, 80s Albopictus invasion, so these inv invasive mosquitoes coming into the center of San Diego and then spreading out, are you concerned about human health risks from the oncoming Dengue, Zika, uh, you know, at the, the, the diseases that are coming up from Mexico now and right at the border lands. And then if they get into these canyons and we're, and we're maintaining wetted areas in these canyons, are you guys concerned about that interface between bringing those diseases right to those people versus going back to drying out the canyons and removing the water from the canyons? Sorry, that was a complex question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Short answer, yes. <laughs> um, fixing that sort of situation is a lot more complicated. Uh, <laughs> it's e much easier said than done. Uh, but, you know, we're always working to remove invasive species from our canyons and to, you know, wherever we can improve the flow of water. Um, but like you said, we are dealing with uh, a whole bunch of impermeable surface all around these canyons. And uh, so, yes, uh, unnatural amounts of water are coming in um, that we have to work with. Uh -huh. I'd just like to add that whatever, whatever we do to slow down the runoff in the canyon is pretty quickly absorbed into the aquifer of the canyon. We're not creating puddles and lakes and that kind of thing in general. And what, from what I've seen, what, uh, you know, and, and we haven't done a lot of, of uh, you know, gray control work in the canyons to slow the runoff and retain water in the canyon. But, it, but again, the idea would not be to create open water opportunities for infestation and that kind of thing, but to, to make sure it absorbs into the soil and what and, and, and so it's not really available to uh, you know mobile infestations uh, as, as far as I know in terms of a water source. Great, can we give the panel uh, another round of applause? Thank you guys.